Welcome everybody. Uh, my name is Amanda. You may know me from the Niagara uh, Peninsula Ontario Ancestors newsletter. Um, I am going to be taking over hosting duties from Steve Fulton, who has normally done it um, for today and ongoing, I guess. Uh, I'd like to welcome today Andrew Humanick um, from the, the Brown, um, sorry, um, the Brown Homestead, <laughs> um, who's coming in today to tell us about the Browns and the Homestead and um, the renovations. I'm going to mention that he has uh, a victory garden at the Homestead that he um, is doing some presentations on for you. And um, but in the meantime, uh, I'm going to pass everything on to Andrew, um, who will be going ahead with his presentation. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you, and good evening to everybody. Uh, thanks for allowing me the opportunity to share a little piece of family history with you today, both uh, the story of the Brown Homestead and, and also the family that settled there, my family. Uh, and I'm going to start with this. Um, running a historic house museum is not always a good idea. And we'll come back to that, but I'll give you one idea, one reason why right now. Um, taking on the responsibility for a 220 year old house in need doesn't leave you a lot of time for research. And like many of you, uh, genealog genealogical research has been a hobby of mine, uh, at times a bit of an obsessive one for, for quite a while. In fact, it's what led to the Brown Homestead Project. Researching my, my fifth grade grandparents, John and Magdalena Brown led me to discover the home they built and to learn uh, that it was for sale and at risk. And, and when we learned that, I, I discussed it with my wife, Jennifer. And at first we said, as others did, it's a shame. We hope someone will do something about that. And that gave way to, well, maybe we can do something. And then that gave way to planning and raising money. And we established a charitable organization to purchase and restore the property as a community resource dedicated to promoting awareness and appreciation of our cultural heritage, which as I suggested, doesn't leave a lot of time for research. And my complaining is mostly tongue in cheek because I recognize how fortunate we are. Uh, I recognize that very few people who share this area of interest have such an incredible artifact from their family still existing. And even if they do, Spending your days caring for the home that your ancestors built is a rare privilege, and it's one that I'm very lucky to have. Uh, and having the opportunity to share their story is also a privilege. So again, thanks for welcoming me, welcoming me here today. Uh, we'll talk more about the homestead, but uh, first there's a few people I want you to meet. Um, so we're going to start by going back to the beginning of the story, not 200 years ago when the house was built but even a little bit further than that. We're gonna start the story a little over 300 years ago and, and not with John Brown, who settled the Brown homestead in St. Catharines, but with his father. Adam Brown was all of one year old when he arrived uh, in the Netherlands en route to England on June 10th, 1709 on a ship fittingly named the Providence. His parents were among many leaving their homes in Southwest Germany after decades of war and more immediately an extremely harsh winter that had wiped out the orchards and vineyards that most of them depended on for work. And they were inspired by the Golden Book, a widely distributed pamphlet written by a German minister who a year earlier had led a small group of settlers to New York, which he described as the land of milk and honey. And he praised the generosity of England's Queen Anne for delivering them there. Uh, by October, the Browns and their seven children were among over 13,000 penniless refugees who arrived in London. Far from being universally welcome, their arrival set off something of a political crisis. Parliament endlessly debated whether these ratty foreigners would corrupt the country and take English jobs or whether they were innocent victims of religious persecution. Politicians were like that back then. Uh, ultimately, the Germans were divided up and sent to Ireland, Virginia, and other places. Adam Brown and his family were among the lucky 3,000 or so who ended up in New York, that, that land of milk and honey, where they were immediately split up into two camps along the Hudson River and ordered to make tar for the British Navy to pay for their, their fare across the ocean. This did not go over very well. The Germans protested, insisting 
that Queen Anne had promised them land along the Shahari River in the Mohawk Valley. And while there's no historical evidence that the British government had actually made such a promise to the Germans, we do know that during the time the Germans were in London, a visiting group of five Mohawk chiefs had been moved by their plights of so much that they offered them Mohawk land along the Shahari River. However it came about, the Germans clearly believed they had a legal claim. And when the tar production floundered and ultimately failed, young Adam and his family were on the move again. And the Browns were among the handful of families that left the camps for the Shahari Valley in late 1712. Having finally reached their promised land, things did not get easier for the settlers right away. They managed to survive a, hairy, a very harsh winter with the help of the Dutch settlers in nearby Schenectady, but more so due to the hospitality of the local Mohawks, part of the Six Nations Confederacy that would play a huge role in the lives of the family for a long time thereafter. More Germans joined them the following year and they formed into seven villages along the Shahari River. It was the beginning of a very hard earned period of peace and prosperity. If you skip over the 15 year legal battle with the Dutch land speculators, who saw the Germans as squatters. Local landowners and the New York governor challenged the Germans land claim once again. And when both sides appealed to London for satisfaction, it was resolved that the Germans should be displaced and offered alternate lands elsewhere. Many of them, including the eldest Brown brother, Philip, opted to leave New York and resettle in Pennsylvania. But his brother, young Adam, remained in Shohari, though he likely had to purchase land to be able to do so. He started a family of his own in this idyllic new homeland, and he would ultimately marry three times, all three times to women named Anna, which I guess just proves that some people have a type. Uh, he was the father of two daughters and two sons by the first wife, and two more sons by his third wife, who survived him. And his widow married Adam Chrysler. And if you recognize the name Adam Chrysler, you probably see where this is going. The Browns and Chryslers were what the Germans called cousin families, and they had ties dating back to Germany. There'd been quite a few marriages between the family members over several generations. So Adam Chrysler became the stepfather to Adam Brown's youngest two sons, Adam Jr. and Joost or Joseph Brown. He was almost certainly also an important figure in the life of a young John Brown who was just 17 when his father died and who subsequently purchased the land adjoining the Chrysler farm along the Shahari River when he married Magdalena Zay in 1770. The oldest Brown brother, Michael, lived nearby as well and their two sisters, Catherine and Magdalena, both married prosperous Dutch farmers, which was a move up the social ladder for young German girls at the time. So the uh, Brown family clearly was a well-respected part of the community. Now, as students of history, we know that peace and prosperity are elusive things. 1770, in addition to being the year that John Brown uh, got married, was the year of the Boston Massacre. And the relationship between Britain and the American colonies was in decline, and it would soon be necessary to pick sides. Adam Chrysler worked in the Indian Department under Joseph Brandt, his childhood friend, and John Butler. And like them, he sided with the loyalist cause from the beginning. When Brandt instructed Chrysler in 1777 to assemble a force of as many loyalists as possible and be prepared to seize control of the valley, the Brown brothers were among the first to sign up. The British were planning simultaneous invasions from Canada and New York City that would divide New England from the rest of the colonies and bring a swift end to the rebellion. So Chrysler and the Brown brothers were part of a force of 70 loyalists and 25 Mohawks that seized the southern end of the valley when the invasion began, while another group led by George Mann seized the north end. Ultimately, the British plan failed. Their loss at Fort Ticonderoga and the surrender at Saratoga were huge blows that turned the tide of the war. Back in Shahari, American reinforcements arrived and captured George Mann and Chrysler pulled back to his own farm to make a stand and there he clashed with the militia. By this point, he was aware that they would be unable to hold the valley on their own. So he disbanded his force and departed for Fort Niagara. Adam and Joseph Brown went with him, Adam joining Brandt's volunteers 
and Joseph joining the newly formed Butler's Rangers. Meanwhile, Michael and John Brown both chose to remain home, perhaps because they both had young children. Interestingly, that was the end of John Brown's active involvement in the hostilities for a number of years. This may simply be a matter of his young family and wanting to protect them, but there was also an intriguing later reference made to John that, quote, in matters of war, his views were decidedly Quakerish. Now that may also cast some light on his decision. In fact, he and several of his children were involved in the early Tunker Church in Niagara, which is, if you're familiar with them, a decidedly Quakerish group. But whatever his outlook, he was undoubtedly under great suspicion and said later that by 1781, he was so persecuted that he could no longer stay. He was in fact ordered to leave New York and his farm, his house, possessions, even the land that his wife had inherited were all seized. And he had little choice but to leave his family, his, his wife and four, children, four daughters behind and make his way to Fort Niagara where he enlisted in Butler's Rangers alongside his brothers, his cousins, and many of his neighbors. It's unknown how much action John saw. Uh, Cornwallis surrendered at Yorktown later that year. And although skirmishing continued in New York for some time, the war was practically over. And when the war ended, John was, much like his grandfather, had been a refugee in a strange land, and most of the loyalists opted to settle near Niagara, including Joseph Brown, John's brother, who would later operate a tavern at Brown's Point. So if you wonder where that name comes from, now you know it's along the uh, Niagara River near Niagara and the Lake. Uh, his other brother, Adam Brown, is one of those enigmatic figures that intrigue and frustrate genealogists. Adam initially joined Joseph Brandt's volunteers, deserted on the way to the attack on Cherry Valley, and then stood trial in Albany uh, before ultimately escaping and joining Butler's Rangers. After that, we're not sure what happened to him. There are some anecdotal accounts of him marrying and settling in Niagara and others of them being killed and scalped later in the war. Uh, so one of those mysteries that we haven't yet quite solved. But John Brown, on the other hand, again, like his grandfather, chose the more difficult path and ventured inland when most of the loyalists opted to stay closer to what's now Niagara and the Lake. The Jubilee History of Thorold says that John and Magdalena settled on the Brown homestead around 1783, but that's almost certainly a little bit early. They were likely in Niagara until at least 1784 when the Rangers disbanded and anecdotal evidence suggests that their first son named Adam after John's father was born at Fort Niagara in 1785. Why he chose to travel inland remains a mystery, but I do remember reading once a part uh, that part of the reason the German refugees were so adamant about staying in the Shahari Valley was that it reminded them of their home along the Rhine River in Germany. It's a romantic notion and, and based on it, Jennifer and I sometimes speculate that John's attraction to the short hills and the river valley near the Brown Homestead was that it reminded him of the Shahari Valley. Now we have no basis for this, but if you visited both, the similarity is actually quite striking. Whatever his motivation, the question also remains about how they were able to get that far inland. When I think of Niagara, the image that most comes to mind to me is visiting my great grandmother Nellie Brown's farm in Waynefleet. And in my lifetime, Niagara has been primarily a place of wide open spaces. But the early accounts of the settlers are very different. For them, most of the inland areas were covered with thick old growth forest, practically impenetrable. And they spoke about rivers full of fish and plentiful game, but also about cougars killing their livestock and bears eating their crops, not the Niagara we think of today. There were at that time, two main inland routes. The better known one was the Iroquois Trail, which ran from Albany, New York to the Niagara River, and then from Queenston along the base of the escarpment to Ancaster. And it formed the basis of what's now Queenston Road and St. Paul Street and St. Catharines, and Main Street in Grimsby. The lesser known route was the Mohawk Trail running along the top of the escarpment from Chippewa to Beaver Dams and to Kew Road through the Brown Homestead and then out to Dundas. Presumably the family when they arrived lived in a log dwelling like many of the early settlers. And some years later, they would begin to build a small stone house to satisfy the settlement duties necessary to ratify John's uh, Loyalist land grant, which happened in, 19, in 1797, 
suggesting that the smaller house was completed a year earlier. That house is still standing and it was incorporated into the rest of the Brown house. The larger part of the house, the grand two-story Georgian facade you see from Pelham Road today, was likely built over two years and was finished soon before John's death in 1804, which makes it the oldest house in, in St. Catharines and one of the oldest in Ontario. In the early years, the house was used for local church services and as a community gathering place. All, all together, John received a total of 900 acres in land grants in Louth Township, Thorold, and Pelham Townships, all around the area of the Short Hills Provincial Park where the three townships meet. In fact, a little more than half of what's the Short Hills Park today was once uh, the Brown Homestead. He and Magdalena had four daughters born in New York and five sons born in Upper Canada, which I like to say is a good example of efficient German engineering. Uh, it's without a doubt a grand home for its time. And one of the curious questions around the house is how a modest farming family that come to Ni Niagara with nothing had been able to build it when most similar families were living in much more modest homes. It's an area we've been researching and I hope someday we're gonna find a better answer. Uh, but yes, despite all the work, the research does continue. In fact, we've just completed a research project looking into the role of the family in the War of 1812. And we'll be releasing both a podcast episode and a journal article on our website uh, in the coming weeks about what we found. So if that's an area that interests you, I invite you to take a look. Another question about the house that sometimes comes up is why, if the farm was in such a remote area, did they build such a grand house? Well, by 1800, it had become much less remote. Niagara was growing very quickly. And what was once the Mohawk Trail had become the route of the Niagara to Dundas stagecoach line. And more and more settlers had been arriving for some time. Likewise, John DeCue had a mill at DeCue Falls, later the site of the Morning Star Mill. And Duncan H Murray had another mill nearby at Power Glen. John Brown and Magdalena Brown both died in 1804 leaving more than 1,200 acres in, in uh, John's will to be divided among his sons, with the eldest, Adam, and youngest son, Adam, who was only seven years old, jointly inheriting the homestead and the house. By 1809, Adam had begun operating a tavern in the house and would continue to do so until the 1830s, one of the benefits of being on a stagecoach line. Soon after he closed the tavern, his neighbor, Henry Smith, who went by the rather grandiose name Henry of Pelham, opened a tavern just down the street. And I understand his descendants run a little wine business on the site today. Uh, Adam's son, Jacob, inherited the homestead in 1857. As a condition of his inheritance, he was to pay certain unspecified debts listed in Adam's will. Those debts and the fact that Jacob was then unmarried may be why he opted to sell the house in 1857 to Joseph Chalou a gentleman farmer who arrived from England in 1845. Now, many of the major changes you see at the house today have been dated to the late 1850s or early 1860s. And for that reason, we tend to attribute them to the Chilu family who farmed the homestead for several decades. They raised many children in the house, including six sons, but two of them left the farm to start an undertaking and furniture making business, and three moved away, leaving only the middle son, George Chilu, at home on the farm. By 1888, Joseph Chalou had moved to a smaller farm, farm nearby and George was farming the homestead when he died suddenly a month before his 30th birthday. That left Joseph Chalou with a large farm and without anyone to pass it on to. He was close to 70 years old and while he moved back to the farm for a short time, Joseph Chalou Jr., his son, returned from the United States and took over the farm at himself again for a short time because his health was not good and the homestead was again sold in 1902. The buyer then was LaFontaine Baldwin Powers and the Powers family with their six young children moved in. Now, the Powers were primarily fruit farmers with orchards behind the house and across the street in what is now the Short Hills Park. We have a great photo in the front hall of the house taken from the front porch of the house that shows the youngest Powers daughter, Annie, sitting on the fence along Pelham Road with the orchards in the background. And that photo came from Annie herself when she visited the house in the early 1980s. She was well into her 80s at that point, having been, been born in the late 1890s. And she recalled that her favorite room in the house was the master bedroom, or as she called it, the big bedroom. 
because when her sisters were all getting married and moving out, her parents let her have the, have the big bedroom. And she even pointed out her initials, AP, carved in the door over 100 years ago now. Uh, and in there it remains as part of what we're protecting at the house. That little moment of history. She also talked about World War I and about how the Canadian Army had conducted training drills in the orchard across the street while the officers sat in the wed window of the big bedroom watching. Sir Sam Hughes, Canada's Minister of Defense during the war, was an occasional visitor to the homestead at that time too. Now the farm was eventually bequeathed to Charlie Powers, the youngest of LaFontaine's two sons, who farmed there with his family until his death in 1978. When we hosted uh, Doors Open in 2017, we met three of the three surviving daughters of Charlie Powers who told us some wonderful stories about growing up in the house. In 1979, though, the house had fallen into disrepair and the Power sisters realized that it had to either be sold or demolished. And given that the house had been a working farmhouse for over 180 years, owned only by three farming families, there'd been very few significant upgrades made. There was no water, running water, for example, and a sale seemed far less likely than a demolition. And that may well have been its fate if it had not been for the fact that someone recognized that the house was one of the few remaining loyalist built homes in Niagara, and that the badly outdated interior was in fact a treasure chest of very old and very rare historic features. Uh, John Jupin is a very well-known uh, restoration uh, uh, consultant in Niagara, and he was the one who bought the house. He'd been familiar with the John Brown house for a very long time. He's talked to us about wandering through the freshly plowed fields across the street as a child, looking for arrowheads and looking up at the house, the big stone house on the hill and wondering what it was. In 1979, he purchased the property and soon began a restoration project to eventually turn the house into a house museum. Now through John, others discovered this historic gem and he was able to get both an exterior and an interior heritage designation for the house. It was in fact, the only house in St. Catharines with both uh, an interior and an exterior designation until last year when Rodman Hall became the second house in St. Catharines with that distinction, which shows you how rare it is. But unfortunately, as we've all experienced, life gets complicated sometimes and, and John was not able to complete his plan and the house ended up back on the market and once again was a risk. One of the benefits of preserving a historic house is that it can always be used as a home but in this specific case, that was problematic because most people aren't willing to live in a house that exists in such an early rustic state. Most of the prospective buyers at that time planned to update the house in a way that was not compatible with its heritage features. Likewise, a historic house used as a private residence will always be a risk by virtue of the fact that it would be passed from owner to owner and it'll always be subject to the willingness of the current owner to preserve it. So when Jennifer and I became aware of the house and began to discuss what we could do and what we should do, we knew we, we, knew we needed a plan to care for it beyond our lifetimes. Today, the house is 220 years old and I begrudgingly acknowledge that I may, not, I may not live for another 220 years. Our primary task is to build a healthy organization with a realizable business and financial plan that can prosper and ensure that the Brown Homestead is cared for beyond our lifetimes. And how do we do that? I told you we would come back to this. Running a historic house museum is generally a bad idea. I say that because it's something of a failing business model. People don't wanna to come to an old house anymore and stand behind a velvet rope and look at chairs that they can't sit in or, or uh, articles that they can't touch. And that doesn't mean that the people who've done that are wrong, quite the contrary. The movement that created that approach sparked a rebirth of interest in the conservation of heritage buildings. But it's time to refresh the way we do things. And if you look around, you'll see that not just historic sites are embracing change, but also museums and theaters and churches and so many other organizations because times change and societies change. And we might not always like the changes we see, but it is happening. I believe for the most part, it's good. And I know that we have to prepare for it. The fate of any historic building depends on it being of value and use to its community. We may wish that a building being historic is enough to ensure that it's cared for, but the truth is that for the John Brown House to be standing for another 220 years, 
it has to be important to the community as a whole today, even to people who don't know who John Brown is, even to people who've never heard of the Butler's Rangers and have no real drive to find out. One of our founding principles was that we would be a community-based organization. And beginning on day one, we engaged in ongoing community outreach, speaking to the people around us about what the Brown Homestead meant to them and what it could mean to them in the future. At this point, we have a good plan. What does the road ahead at the Brown Homestead look like? Well, in addition to the John Brown House, we're planning to build a new building, a LEED certified green building showcasing both traditional building methods and modern technology. And that'll allow us to expand our programming capacity, but also to take a preservation first approach to the heritage structures on the property. We also have an 1810 barn that'll be moved to the site and adapted to be a three season event space. And the homestead's also home to the John Norton cabin, an 1817 log structure built by Mohawk chief John Norton. Now, although he's best known for his leadership during the War of 1812 and the Battle of Queenston Heights, he was a community leader, an educator, and a Renaissance man who spoke multiple languages. The cabin will be housed in an interior courtyard in the new building where it can be properly cared for. And in recognition of Norton's legacy, the new building will be named the Open Door Center. This is a reference to, to Norton's Mohawk name, Dayonan Hokarawan, which linguist Charles Cook translated as his door is open. And it's a, an allusion to Norton's friends finding the doors open, not only to his home, but to its heart. And that's a philosophy we, we really try to embrace at the Brown Homestead. We want people to feel like the doors are open and that it's a place for them, it's a place for everybody. And when it is completed, it will once again, as it was over 200 years ago, be a community gathering space. When Jennifer and I founded the charity to purchase and preserve the Brown Homestead, we did so with the idea that by exploring the past and telling the stories of how we got here, this place could be an engine of progress and development. We believe that all historic sites can be and that they should be. Because what better way to celebrate the lives lived here? The Brown, the Chalu, and the Powers family, the farmers, the teachers, the doctors, the bus drivers who helped build our community, than to let their home be a place where the community, all of us, come together to continue to find that better path forward. So that's the history and we hope the future of the Brown Homestead. Thank you very much. With the updating, what would you say? Um, has been the most important piece of what that you've done so far? Boy, it, it's, uh, I've, I've got a list of essential pieces, but uh, I think, I think uh, there are a number of things that were necessary, but I think the most important one has been to open the doors and talk to people, even events like this. And I, I would encourage everyone, if you'd like to learn more, uh, and I see for a, few, a few familiar names in the list. So to those people I say, come back, but if you haven't been to the homestead, please come out and see what we're doing. Great opportunity for that is uh, on August 20th this year, we're participating in Doors Open St. Catharines again. Uh, come and see what we're doing. And while you're there, uh, visit our, our, uh, our, we, our join the conversation booth. We'd love to hear your thoughts. And it's never too late to add some more voices to the, uh, to the, uh, the planning. Great ideas come from, from all directions. And uh, we, we want uh, the Brown Homestead to be a place where everyone both feels welcome, but they also feel like it's, it's their homestead as well. Oh, sorry, that's perfect. Um, and Lois, have we got some questions? Yeah, but I wonder, um, Andrew, could you just talk a little bit about the Victory Garden? Yes, the Victory Garden is a new initiative this year. And uh, we, we've had the, the, I'll tell you a little bit about the origin of it first. We've had the good fortune in, in the recent past to, to partner a little bit with, uh, with United Way Niagara. And they've been involved in a number of initiatives that we've participated in, but most recently they have a real uh, uh, focus on dealing with food insecurity in, in Niagara. And we saw this as an opportunity to both participate in the community, but also develop an educational program. And what we've done is we've created a traditional victory garden based on the, uh, the World War II style garden of, of backyard yard garden. And we're going to be both growing produce all heirloom varieties uh, and teaching people how to do their own garden at home as well as hosting a speaker series 
where people can learn about different elements related to uh, to uh, growing their own garden. For example, there's one on uh, on how to save and, and preserve seeds to plant next year. There's one on uh, maintaining beehives, uh, and uh, that some are a little bit more historically based. And probably the the, the most fun part of uh, of the program is that all of the produce we grow this year is going to be uh, donated to local food banks through uh, through the United Way's initiatives, and uh, so we're going to be be participating that way as well. And we've we've had a great uh, a great turnout for that. Okay, I do have another question here. During the restoration, did you find anything interesting, such as family artifacts hidden away? We found we found a real assortment of things. We had first of all, we had a great collection of items that uh, that the previous owner uh, John Jupian had found. He was actually uh, an archaeologist by training, so uh, he turned over a big box of things that he found. And but we continued to find things. There's an area uh, towards the back where the oldest part of the house is, where uh, as I like to say, you can't put a shovel in the ground without coming up with pieces of pottery, and uh, and and glass and so on. Uh, we've we've found uh, old uh, uh, bone buttons and and pearl buttons from from the early Victorian era there, and we also uh, a few years ago found a little collection of of uh, of cast iron uh, or actually sorry lead uh, toy soldiers that we had someone look at that were dated to around 1900. So someone at some point had stashed those under the floorboards, and we uh, we found them. So. Um, the, the discoveries the discoveries continue there there also been stories we've been told of uh, of muskets having been dug up here and there and, and we've never found anything like that and no one's ever been able to produce them for us you know how uh, those uh, little little oral traditional stories uh, happen to be uh, 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 up here all the time uh, we have to verify them but uh, it's uh, it's it's uh, it hasn't given up all its secrets yet the, the work continues Okay. You know, along those lines, I should mention as well, uh, in planning for the work we're going to be doing on site, we are planning a formal uh, archaeological survey uh, in the coming 12 months at some point. So at that point, uh, who knows what the possibilities are. Oh, that's, mm -hmm. that's exciting. Mm -hmm. So somebody has a comment in the chat, chat, fascinating. There are so many gems in Niagara. I will definitely visit next time I visit the peninsula. And we'll keep August 20th in mind. So yeah, um, I haven't been there either. And I do intend to um, go to see it. Oh, here's another question. You mentioned that John Brown was German and immigrated from New York. Were most German immigrants to the Newark region in the late 1700s from New York or Pennsylvania? Uh, that really, they were more spread out than that. The, the Butler's Rangers themselves drew from from New York, Pennsylvania, New Jersey, and other places. Uh, mostly, it was it was from the from the Northeast, but a lot of the other militias uh, uh, were from from the same the same uh, areas of the states. And uh, there were, of course, also a number of uh, of uh, German soldiers who served with the British in in the Revolutionary War who ended up settling in Canada. As well as, of course, uh, the indigenous allies were a big part of uh, of the war effort, especially in uh, in New York. Okay, another question here. I am interested in the family lineage. One of my ancestors was Sarah Palmer, married name McHenry, and I believe one of her siblings married a Brown. Some of their ancestors moved to the Halton and Wellington County areas. One of Sarah's sisters was. Anna Mary Palmer, do any of these names sound familiar in your research? They were loyalists who came from South Carolina. The Palmer name definitely does sound familiar and I, I can't say for sure without looking uh, through my notes. Um, so it is quite possible. Uh, definitely send me an email and we can, we can uh, uh, compare notes. I would be very interested in doing that. I know there were a group of Browns uh, including uh, John and Magdalene, his daughter Sophia, who moved to uh, to Halton. Uh, but there also were other Browns in the area, uh, both Browns that we were related to, uh, primarily Joseph's family in uh, in Niagara. Also, some of Adam's descendants uh, moved up to uh, Ontario thereafter. But there also were other Browns, some British and Scottish Browns, who were not related to. And it's one of the challenges of of, of uh, 
researching an ancestor named John Brown is, uh, it's, it's not the most rare name in the world. Somebody made a comment. Some of the New York Germans went to Dundas County. Mm -hmm. um, and another comment, thank you for your response and thank you for doing this important work. I'm looking forward to visiting the Brown Homestead. Um, a thank you. Were there other Browns from New Jersey in the same area? Um, for, uh, Browns from New Jersey, I'm not sure. Or do you mean other Browns in the, in the New York area? There was another branch of the Brown family that were actually uh, on the other side of the conflict. And they uh, 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 remained behind in, in uh, Shahari Valley. And I think that may be part of where the answer to the question of, of how did uh, the Browns have the means to build the grand house that they built was probably the fact that they had a, uh, an ongoing relationship with the, the rest of the family. And while they may have been politically uh, on different sides of the equation, we do know that the relationship continued between them and was an amicable one. So uh, there certainly were cases of, uh, of family helping family across the border in that time. Um, but I did want to thank you, Andrew, for popping in and, and uh, wonderful um, work that you're doing um, and appreciate all of the all the background work that you must have done in order to pull all of this together and and to keep doing what you're doing. So thank you very much for joining us today. Um, I, I, I appreciate it very much. It's 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 really, uh, you know, sometimes I get to be the figurehead, but we like to say we're a small organization made up of a lot of people. And we have a, we have a great staff and, and we have an incredible volunteer base and and even people from the community who step up and help us uh, regularly. It's uh, it's 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 very much a team effort. And and as I said at the beginning, it's such a privilege to have the opportunity to do what I do. I, I recognize how many people who, who love studying their family history never have the opportunity that I have. So uh, uh, it, it is hard work but it's, uh, it's our work that we're very fortunate to be able to do. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. So I would encourage everyone, I've posted some links into the chat um, to, to go visit the Brown Homestead's website, to go visit their Facebook and Instagram and Twitter, and to go visit the Brown Homestead. Um, if you're able to check out the Victory Garden presentations that are coming up and definitely uh, head out if you're able to on August 20th to the Open Doors St. Catharines. Um, and I also wanted to mention that Lois is hosting the genealogy drop-in on June the 1st. Um, you can find it on the Niagara um, OGS website. Um, just pop over there, same place that you went to register for this um, presentation. Um, and hopefully we'll see you on June 1st. But thank you everyone for coming. I'm sorry. One more thing, Amanda, just yeah. before we go. Another, mm -hmm. not, something just popped in the chat here. Somebody mm -hmm. had a momentary power outage, so they weren't, um, they weren't seeing stuff. So, so I missed an answer to whether changes have been documented photographically. That's a great question. And it's a very important one. Documentation is, is very critical. And what, what that touches on is the fact that, that restoration is, is a really challenging area because uh, to, to change something is inherently to lose something. And uh, you always have to make careful choices as to what you're going to change, what you're going to keep, and what happens when you have different layers of, of, of time represented differently. And, uh, and, and we definitely, in our approach, have moved away from the single date restoration approach. We're not trying to uh, choose one period to restore to. Uh, but it still does remain a challenge. And yes, we are both documenting and preserving as much as we can. In one case, there's, a, there's an upstairs partition that we need to remove that's been there since probably uh, the early 1860s. And uh, for structural reasons, we need to remove it, but we're actually going to uh, remove it in pieces and use it as a living exhibit in our new building and talk about uh, its time there. And it's going to be extensively photographed and, and, uh, and uh, It'll be represented as well once it's gone, uh, probably with uh, uh, shades of, of uh, uh, different colors of paint to demonstrate where the where the partition once was. So, preservation as much as possible, both through documentation and by by keeping as much as we can. Yes. Wonderful. 
Yes, and I'm seeing a lot of thank yous in the chat and people are going to share the recording and I should mention that as well that the recording will be available um, to our members um, on the website um, in the next couple of days. So thank you again very much. Is there anything else that you want to add? Actually, there's one question I, I received by direct message if we have time for one more. Go ahead. Okay. Someone asked about Brown family records and, and a big part of our plan uh, is we're going to be building the, uh, uh, a, 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 an archive and research center, which will be housed in the house. And we have ourselves, uh, as I said, a number of artifacts from the site, but also uh, family history research and artifacts that have been donated to us, all kinds of uh, everything from uh, old letters and photos and photo albums that are gonna be stored and protected there. And they'll all be digitized so that they'll be available for uh, for um, uh, researchers to to access uh, while being kept safe. And we've also had other people from other branches of the Brown family approach us about potentially storing their uh, records there. And uh, we would be happy either to accept donations of those things and protect them, but we also want to give people the opportunity to uh, give them to us on loan, and we'll take care of them and. Put them in proper archival storage uh, while they, uh, they they keep ownership of them. So that's uh, something uh, very important uh, to us, and uh, something we want to get that word out to uh, to the rest of the uh, of, of the Brown descendants. A couple of whom I see in, in the in the list of attendees today. Hello, guys. <laughs> that's wonderful. Well, again, thank you very much, Andrew, for joining us. We really appreciate the work that you've been doing, and um, and you for sharing it with us.